Hi there, I'm Tom Bagwell and welcome to Hello Health, a partnership with the Oxner Health System and Humana to bring Oxner's Hello Health weekly education and information series to you. Our topic this week, skin cancer and Mohs surgery. Our guest is dermatologist Sunita Walia. First, some background. Dr. Walia earned her medical degree from the Louisiana State University College of Medicine before joining Oxner. Dr. Walia also completed a Mohs Surgery Fellowship, spent about four years in the D.C. area, and she's certified by the American Board of Dermatology. And we are pleased to welcome back to the program Dr. Sunita Walia to Hello Health. Good to have you with us again. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, you betcha. So how common, remind us, how common is skin cancer? Extremely common. In fact, it's the most common cancer worldwide in the United States. We say about one in five Americans will get a skin cancer in their lifetime. Each year, there are more new cases of skin cancer than there are combined cases of colon, lung, breast, and prostate cancer. Mm. Puts it in a larger perspective. Talk about the different types of skin cancer, Dr. Wally. So there are three main types of skin cancer basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma, and these all arise from different types of cell types in the skin. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common and the slowest growing type of skin cancer. And then the middle is squamous cell carcinoma, which can sometimes grow a little bit faster than the basal cell. And the third type is the melanoma, which is the worst. It is the least common of all the skin cancer types, but is the one that contributes to the most of the skin cancer deaths. And we've got pictures we're showing you throughout the program this morning. Uh, and in some cases, we might suggest that you look away if you're a little squeamish about these sorts of things, but that's medicine uh, and, and that's uh, being a, a skin, uh, sir, skin doctor, cancer doctor, and, and in some cases, a skin surgeon with, the, with what you're doing uh, in the room. What are the symptoms of skin cancer and are there always symptoms? So most of the times there are actually no symptoms of skin cancer. Patients will always say that they felt there was a pimple kind of growing in the area and that's usually what they think it is. Um, occasionally it can scab, itch, bleed, or just be a sore that comes and goes and it's not healing. In the cases of melanomas, usually there are some kind of changes in colors and things like that. Can I look at a spot or a lesion and tell if it's worrisome? So um, you can look at different types of moles on your skin and you can look at them and see if they have changed at all. So we actually talk about the A, B, C, Ds and E's of moles. So A for asymmetry or irregularity in one side versus the other. B for border irregularity where, one, where the, the edges are scalloped or jagged. C for color changes. So if, if one side is darker than the other or there's multiple colors in them. D for diameter changes, so if anything gets larger than a pencil eraser, that's a little bit more worrisome. And then E for evolution or changing moles, because these are all things that can happen over time. So melanomas can arise in a pre-existing mole that has changed over time. And that's for melanomas. Now for basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers, it's usually a shiny pearly bump that is not healing. We talked about the three different types. Let's go back and look at them. And let's start with the basal cell sure. carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma is oftentimes a pearly, shiny bump that has these rolled borders on the edges, can sometimes have some blood vessels on the surface, and we can see some pictures here of different types of basal cell skin cancers here. Very commonplace here on the nose. Okay, and then uh, the next one? So this is a squamous cell carcinoma, which is a more angry looking lesion. It's more defined, round, really a nodule and kind of a little bit more coming out of the surface of the skin. And finally, malignant melanoma. And here we have the malignant melanoma, which is this really dark, um, irregular brown patch. Uh, our, our most primary care physicians, so you're a specialist in this area, our most primary care physicians, if I'm in for my regular checkup, is this the kind of thing my primary care physician could spot, should spot? Yeah, for the most part, they can spot it and send you to the dermatologist to get evaluated. For squamous cell carcinoma, sometimes they can actually mimic um, cysts and abscesses. So that may be one instance where the primary care physician may put someone on antibiotics thinking that's going to heal the lesion because those are oftentimes more raised up on the skin. Okay. Are some of us more likely to develop skin cancer than others? Yes, definitely. There are certain risk factors for skin cancer. Having fair skin, so light hair, light eyes. Um, we joke that I will probably be a patient of yours <laughs> at some point. Potentially, yeah, right. right. So also a history of sunburns, especially blistering sunburns. Sometimes all it takes is one or two bad sunburns to cause enough of the damage in the skin cells to give us skin cancer. Certainly excessive sun exposure. 
Um, tanning beds has been a big, big risk factor these days. In fact, the World Health Organization has classified tanning beds as a type 1 carcinogen along with cigarettes. There are more cases of skin cancer attributed to tanning beds than there are lung cancer cases contributed by smoking. Is there, anything, so, is there any such thing as a safe tanning bed? No such thing as a safe tanning bed. The only thing that you can do is a spray on tan. But even one tanning bed session can increase your risk of developing a skin cancer by 67%. Wow. And what's happening internally? So I'm, I'm sure I got sunburned when I was a kid. In mm -hmm. fact, I, I know that was the case. But here now 30, 40, and, and you know, thank goodness I haven't had any problems yet, but, but likely that, that I would. Um, right. How can something happen 30 to 40 years later? How can I feel the effects 30 to, four years, uh, 30 to 40 years later from something? It takes a long time for the mutations in the skin cells to actually manifest. So you're getting the sun exposure, you're getting sun damage, and it's a cumulative exposure over time, but that ultraviolet damage has begun from the beginning, and those, that UV light is getting into the skin cells and causing those mutations. It just takes 20 to 30 years to develop. Wow. Talk about the different treatment options for skin cancer today. So there are topical creams that we can use for superficial skin cancers. Um, some are considered topical chemotherapeutic agents, whereas others actually stimulate the body's own immune system to fight the cancer. There's also what we call electrodesiccation and curatage, which is scraping and burning the skin cancer. A standard excision, which is taking a, about a four to five millimeter margin around the, the cancer and cutting it out that way. Radiation therapy, which we tend to not do unless the patient cannot tolerate one of the other procedures or a surgical procedure. Um, and then finally, Mohs micrographic surgery, which is the most effective treatment for skin cancers. Okay, and Mohs surgery has been around for a long time, uh, but only recently, per fairly recently perfected, right? Right, so Dr. Mohs, it's actually named after Dr. Mohs, it's not an acronym, but Dr. Mohs described the procedure in Wisconsin in the 1940s, and it got perfected in the 80s to how we do it now. And let's talk about Mohs surgery and how it works, and then we're gonna show people, the doctor's gonna show us how it works. So Mohs surgery is a precise and total removal of the skin cancer where 100% of the tissue that we remove is examined while the patient waits. So it allows us to get complete tumor and cancer removal by actually preserving as much normal tissue as possible. Okay. We're going to take a look at the video now. I do want to warn you that there is some cutting of the skin. Um, so we're going to describe it. You'll hear the doctor. Uh, we'll let you know when the video is over just in case you wanted to turn away. But let's take a look, doctor. All right, so Miss June has a superficial squamous cell carcinoma on her left forehead here. And right now, we're about to take off the cancer part. I'm going to take my layer or my margin of normal tissue here. And this is the layer that we are going to process and check to make sure the cancer is all gone. This is the actual margin of tissue I took off of her. And I'm going to be cutting it and I'm going to be inking it different colors so that when I look at it under the microscope, if I see cancer, I know if it's by this blue side here or by the red side. So now bring the tissue into the lab and they're going to start processing the tissue for me. So you can see my whole tissue here, my blue ink, my red ink, and this is all normal skin here, normal, 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 until we get here. And here we can see that she still has residual squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So we know we have to go back and take some more only in this portion of the lesion. By the way, the music you heard there was music by our crack production team here at Oxner. Not the kind of music you play during surgery. What kind of music is that? Oh, it would be like a mix of the 60s and the 70s, Pandora. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says they want to come back for the music. <laughs> Very nice. Patients are awake when all this is happening? Patients are awake. So that's the advantage of most surgery is that it is a completely outpatient procedure under local anesthesia. No general anesthesia is needed. I, we're going to talk about all the advantages of most surgery, but I would think one of the big ones is when you're leaving that day, you know you're cancer free. Definitely. Definitely. So everything's done at one time. So And the other advantages? There are other advantages. So it's going to be tissue sparing, which means that the, the most amount of normal tissue is there. And we give them the smallest possible scar. 
um, has the, the best cosmetic result and has the highest cure rate, 99% cure rate by doing the skin cancer removal in this manner. Mm. And it's extremely cost effective because we're doing everything under local anesthesia in the clinic setting, and then once the patient's all clear, then I stitch them up and fix them all at one time. One stop shop. So it wasn't 100% and very few things are in life. What are the chances of in an area where you have done the procedure of the, the uh, cancer returning? 1% chance. This is a very effective and highly curative procedure. Okay, so who's a candidate for most surgery? Is it right for everyone? So we do most surgery mostly in the head and neck areas. So areas, we say the T-zone in the face. So the eyes, the nose, and the lips area. Uh, areas of also include the ears, the temples, and the scalp. Um, any cosmetically and functionally important location. So we also do it on areas on the body. The tumors are large, greater than two centimeters in size. For certain lesions that are more aggressive subtype, um, those that have been treated before and have come back, so recurrent tumors. And in those patients who are immunosuppressed, such as organ transplant patients, they are also prime candidates for Mohs surgery. How commonplace is Mohs surgery today? We know it's being offered at Oxner. Is, right. is it in other parts of the, of the city and is it obviously all across the country? Yes, right? it, is, it is quite common actually. It's the gold standard, so there are Mohs surgeons in almost every location now. Yeah. Our guest this week is Dr. Sunita Wally, and we're talking about skin cancer and treatment options like Mohs surgery. Now we have some great examples of what the patient looked like before, and then so you saw the cutting there, for those of you who are watching, you said, oh my gosh, I'm never going to look the same. We have four uh, wonderful examples of some of Dr. Wally's patients. It's just remarkable to see the before and after picture. So walk right. us through these, if you would. Sure. So in the first image there, we see the patient, I've outlined the area of the cancer. In this case, it was a basal cell carcinoma on the left cutaneous upper lip there, on the left upper lip. So after two stages of Mohs surgery, we see the, the area that we've removed, the circle that's left behind. And um, so then you can see we stitch it up by taking out a triangle above and below it. We do have to elongate it in order to bring it together. So when we stitch it up into one kind of straight line that blends in with the natural skin lines. And how long, before we move to the second one, uh, how long between the time that you stitch, and is the, the stitching up takes place that day? That day, right then and there. Okay, how Once long am I wearing? I'm wearing a Band-Aid, some, something along those lines, right? So you're wearing a bandage in between stages while you're waiting, and then you leave with a pressure bandage that you change um, every day and until you come back a week later to get your stitches out. And about how long before I, I start to look like that final picture? So that, that's about a month out. So you can see there's still a little bit of redness there. So the redness can take about six months to fade. So, but by about a month, most patients are pretty well healed. All right. Let's look at a little more of a severe case now. This is on the nose. Walk us through this one, doctor. So this is the most common place where I work is the nose. Uh, and this was also a basal cell carcinoma in this lady. And we had to go three stages here um, in order to remove the cancer. And the nose is not like the forehead or the chin or the cheek where there's a lot of extra tissue to bring together. So we had to be a little bit more creative in the nose. And in this case, we use the skin above, which is a little bit more loose. And this is called a skin flap, where we actually slide the skin from above down in order to fix it. So this is what we call a bilobed flap that we have taken skin from above and slid down to fix it. A little bit of geometry, it goes a long way. And again, about a month about or so? About a month after. Before that. Well, and in the third case, we're looking at Mohs surgery of the ear, right? Correct. So in this case, this cancer went a little bit deeper, and we did have to take the, the, the cartilage out. So we need to replace that volume, and so in doing so, we can actually cut down the rim of the ear and then lift it up and slide it up and bring it up to recreate the ear rim. So the ear is going to be a little bit shorter compared to the other side, but the contour is all still there. And moving back to, uh, this looks like the same patient from the second one. I don't know if it is or not, but this is also working on the nose, but in a different area of the nose. Correct. So this is what we call a skin graft. So this patient had a, a skin cancer at the very bottom of her nose and that rim, where it sometimes can be trickier to move skin around. So she elected to have a skin graft where you borrowed skin from one place and sewed it on. And this is a skin graft. Mm. The statistics tell us we're seeing more and more cases of, of melanoma, especially superficial melanomas of the head and neck. What does that look like? And, and we want to clarify what superficial, sometimes superficial might 
you might think, well, nothing really to worry about. It's just a mark. But superficial melanoma is still cancer, right? It is still cancer. It is the best kind to have of the melanomas, but it is still cancer and needs to be addressed because over time it can grow deeper and become more invasive. Let's take a look at an example here. Okay, so we see this lady has this ill-defined dark patch um, on her left cheek. And this is what superficial melanomas look like. They can be these dark, irregular freckles on sun-exposed areas um, in fair-skinned individuals. So uh, before we get to this next slide, again, I want to warn our viewers that uh, this is probably one of the more drastic ones uh, to look at. So right before we go to it, I'll let you know. Uh, but what is the best way to treat superficial melanoma of the head and neck? Again, and if you're squeamish about these sorts of things, we'd ask you just to listen and turn away for just a moment. So we still want to do a surgical excision of the area, whereby we're still assessing all margins, the periphery and the depth at the same time, like we do with the most surgery. But instead of doing it within an hour and getting the results within an hour that same day, we actually process the tissue overnight. And it's a rush overnight processing. So we call it slow mos because it's over a day instead of within an hour. And we do it this way because it gives us a more accurate read of the tumor cells and has a less risk of recurrence. I'm still go am I going home? Still so an outpatient going home. procedure. Still an outpatient procedure, but you come in, we remove it, and, it's, and then we put a bandage on you, then you come back the next day. The next day, I find out if there's any residual melanoma still there. If so, we take some more, and then you go home, come back the next day. So it can take a couple of days. And what are we looking at here in this image? So in this image, we see a lady who has um, an ill-defined melanoma in situ, or superficial melanoma, on the right left side of her eye there, and it's ill-defined, so we don't really know where the borders start and where they stop. So that's so important for the reason why we need to do this type of slow mo procedure. So this area took us three times to clear it, so we went back three times to make sure we got all the cancer gone, and then you can see here that it went much wider than what we can see the naked eye, and that's the case for most of these skin cancers. The cancer cells oftentimes go wider than we think. All right, we're away from the image now for those who want to return back to us. And you, the analogy is it's like the tip of an iceberg, sometimes like the tip of an iceberg. Correct, right? exactly, and so what I tell patients all the time is because what you see in the surface is not what's going on underneath. So we have to use our microscope to chase out these cells and, and make sure we get it all out. Is there a day coming that we'll have a machine that just scans over the area and tells you where we need to be cutting and where we don't need to be cutting? So that's coming. There are things in the pipeline for that, but still nothing's going to be as good as you know the, the human looking at it under the microscope itself. Right. I asked you if you're a plastic surgeon, uh, just based on the results. By the way, before I get to that, so the, the, the image we showed was pretty severe. Right. Um, would she get back to, would that patient get back to looking normal? Would that require, I would imagine, a skin graft? That was actually a multidisciplinary approach that involved oculoplastics, plastics involvement because it was such a large area on the side of her eye. So there was some eye reconstruction that had to happen, some cheek reconstruction. But she has a complete functional and cosmetic outcome that's quite well. So do you consider yourself a, a, I know you're a cancer surgeon, but do you consider yourself a plastic surgeon? Again, the results we showed people earlier are phenomenal. Well, thank you. Uh, I did not do a plastic surgery residency, but as part of my fellowship, we are trained to repair wounds and make it as cosmetically appealing with an aesthetic outcome as possible. So, so it's one-stop shop. You know, we do it all here. I would imagine this has to be one of the most satisfying areas yeah. of, of medicine. I love it. I have a great team. I love what I do. Um, it's very rewarding knowing that the patients come in with skin cancer. I've removed it in the highest cure rate possible and then fix it in the best possible way. Are there cases where uh, you don't know what, what's there? You start to look in and find that it's beyond uh, your area of expertise. Yes. Oh yeah, that happens quite often actually. Um, on, the, on the scalp, for instance, sometimes we know these can cancers can grow down deep and wide. So if it gets down to the bone, that's something that I'll have to stop in my clinical setting and refer out to our head and neck surgeons. And at Oxygen, we have a great team of physicians who are always there to help us out when we need them. Okay. So what's next? Uh, you've been on the show before, uh, and I hope, I very much hope that you will be back with us sure, again. Sure, if you so have me. If it's three years or five years from now, what is it that we're talking about? What's the next breakthrough? 
the next breakthrough might actually be some, some oral chemotherapeutic agents that we can do that will be well tolerated by patients that can help shrink down the tumors um, so that way we won't have to cut out as wide of an area. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about in the area of prevention? So sunscreen. What advice? Sunscreen, right? Yes. We had to start early. So we get most of our sun exposure before we're 18 years old. So we had to teach our kids at an early age how to apply sunscreen, how often to apply sunscreen. Um, so I have two girls and my girls know that they have to reapply every two hours and they have these sticks that they apply on their faces and on their, their part line in the scalp um, anytime they go outside. So we say that we want patients to put on about an ounce of sunscreen for all sun exposed areas. That's about this amount in a shot glass. I think patients don't put enough on and they don't reapply every two hours. Because if you don't reapply, it's as if you never put any on. So nothing's waterproof, everything has to be reapplied. What advice do you have for uh, how often people should be screened uh, for melanoma and skin cancer? So if there's a family history of melanoma that I think once a year is, is adequate. Um, anybody who has a history of melanoma, it's usually every three months for the first two years after the melanoma diagnosis is how often we need to screen these patients. And then patients should be doing skin checks on their own because as dermatologists, they're only seeing the patients at a snapshot in time. So um, now with smartphones, I think it's a good idea for patients to take pictures of their moles so they can follow it over time. What role does the spouse or partner play in all of this? I will say that most of my patients come in because their spouse told them they needed to get that area checked out. So it's a very important role. What does SPS stand for? And what is the difference? And is there such thing as overkill? Is SPS 15 or 30 just as good as SPS 50? So SPF stands for sun protection factor. And it tells us how much time we can actually be outside um, without getting sunburned. So really, there's SPF 15, SPF 30. SPF 30 is really all that you need. Um, once you get above SPF 30, it doesn't provide us with that much extra protection, um, but the key is reapplying every two hours. So an SPF of 30 with the right ingredient, so we recommend anything with zinc or titanium dioxide in it because those are chemical blockers and so they reflect the sun's rays. So they're most effective at UVA and UVB rays, which is what we're getting from the sun. What are the Walia girls wearing? They're wearing zinc oxide. They're cats for the ghost. So they, they know, and they're, they're, they're white as can be when they apply that sunscreen on. Sorry, girls. Yeah, yeah. they know. They, <laughs> they know. And, and, you know, you buy the tube, and, and, you know, and it's only a dollar more for the tube that's this big, and, and it sits in your closet for three to four years. Yeah. What about expiration dates, and how important are those? One year. So you can, you know, you, I would say one year, and you need to toss it. But if you're going to be outside, and most of us are, especially here in South Louisiana, so you know that that tube shouldn't be lasting a year anyway. Insurance cover a Mohs surgery? Absolutely. This is skin cancer and the reconstruction afterwards is covered as well. It's and, not considered cosmetic. And, and screenings. And what questions should we be asking? our Because in most cases, we're starting with primary care physicians, right? Right, right. So um, anything that's unusual, that's growing, um, things like that, the sores that are not healing, those are the areas that if the primary care physician sees or hears the patient's talking about, then the referral to the dermatologist is warranted. Okay. And, and finally, the fallacy of uh, dark skin people don't have to worry about this. Correct. That is a misconception that dark skin provides us with adequate protection because it does not. And oftentimes, in darker skin patients, the skin cancers are more aggressive because they've been there longer because patients think that they, they can't get a skin cancer. Um, but that's not true. In fact, Bob Marley died of a melanoma on his toe that he thought was a soccer bruise, but it actually was a melanoma that had spread. Mm -hmm. Your final chance to warn parents out there who have children like yours. Get them in these early habits now. It's, it'll save them from a lot of heartache later on in life. All right. Dr. Sunita Walia, thank you so much for being with us. And again, I hope you are back sooner than yes, later. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you again for having and me. And for your wonderful work. Thanks to the doctor and for the education and information she's provided and for her work in the Oxner Health System. 
Well, here's what's happening, ways you can keep in touch with the program to make an appointment with any Oxner physician, including this week's guest, or to register for any of our Oxner's Hello Health seminars. They take place all across the greater New Orleans area. You can call Oxner at the number you see right there on your screen, or send us an email, and here's our email address. There it is, hellohealth at oxner.org. As a reminder, you can rewatch this week's presentation and many of our other Hello Health programs on Oxner's website at oxner.org. Just type Hello Health in the search box. Our thanks again to this week's guests. Thanks to Humana and Oxner for making our program possible. And our final thanks, as always, is to you for your support of this program, Hello Health. I'm Tom Bagwell. We'll see you next time.